<laughs> All right, let's see what's on YouTube today. Oh, nice, new video from John. Well, how are you feeling? You got John Riggs here, and I thank you for checking out the channel. I have 16 videos, 16 channels that are gonna be big in 2021. This channel is a tree I've been barking up for the last little while. It's my buddy Stefan. Um, he has one of the greatest collections here in the United States that is public about it. Um, it doesn't just, he just, he doesn't just have a bunch of games. Definitely encourage you to check out this channel. All right, keep it together, Stefan. You can do this. It's just YouTube. No pressure. Let's go. Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of Art of Nintendo Power. On this channel, I'll bring you the art, craft, and history of Nintendo Power Magazine. I'm coming to you from here, the Art of Nintendo Power Studio, also known as my garage. I know it's not much to look at now, but I figured that we'd start early and then you could watch me slowly build the studio into something really cool. On this first episode of Art of Nintendo Power, we're going to be looking at this piece here, the cover to Nintendo Power Volume 32. This piece really needs no introduction. Super Castlevania 4 for the Super Nintendo. Not only did I pick this piece because it's my favorite, but it's also gigantic, and a few other things actually make it unique among other Nintendo Power covers. First thing, yes, its size does make it unique. This is by far the largest physical cover I've ever seen for original art for Nintendo Power magazine. The medium is also pretty surprising. Typically painted Nintendo Power covers are airbrushed acrylics. But this painting is actually oil on canvas, making it the only oil painting in the Art of Nintendo Power archive. One thing to note about oil paintings, if you are going to be caring for one, is that typically you don't actually frame it with glass over it. However, as you may or may not know, once we have conventions again, my intent is to tour this collection and I can't have a one-of-a-kind oil painting exposed to open air. So there is actually a museum acrylic over this. However, there are spacers between the painting and the glass, so it's very important when you are framing an oil painting, if you are going to put glass over it, that you make sure that there's no way that that oil painting is going to touch the glass. It can take a very long time for oils to cure correctly, and even then, if there's too much heat and the painting does come in contact with that glass, it can stick to the glass. So spacers are very important. Back to the painting, uh, one thing I wanted to point out is how vibrant this piece is. If you look at it in person, it's very, very different from the actual cover. If you look at the cover for Nintendo Power Volume 32, a lot of the background around Belmont is lost completely. In this actual painting, if you look, you can see this gigantic stone column and all of this brickwork behind him that just so, sort of gets swallowed up by the cover and the uh, lack of print quality. So when people ask me why it's important to archive original art, this is one of the reasons. When you print something, no matter how good your printer is, you are gonna lose some of that fidelity. Something else that I think makes this piece really interesting is that the artist actually doesn't care for it. Hey everybody, just a quick editing note here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about why I choose not to, in many cases, uh, identify an artist for any given piece. Um, almost all the time, this is 100% up to the artist. Um, in very few cases have I not been able to track down the artist and ask them if they would like to be named. Um, you need to keep in mind that unlike up-and-coming artists or, um, or artists who really are striving for that notoriety, most of the artists that painted for Nintendo Power, drew for Nintendo Power, are uh, commercial artists that are retirement age and don't necessarily want the spotlight uh, that 
me broadcasting their name all over the internet could possibly provide. Uh, so I just want everyone, you know, I know that there are, um, you know, a, a subset of you who do feel very strongly about this and, and really feel like artists should be identified and named. And I promise you that anytime an artist does want to be named or if that artist is deceased, I do identify them. Um, but in this particular case, uh, I, I'm not identifying the artist and that is, uh, primarily due to privacy. So I just want to get that out of the way, and now back to the video. In talking to him, it turns out that this piece was actually significantly repainted after the first time he painted it. It turns out that both the left arm and the left leg were repainted and moved. If you look closely at that left arm, it's proportionally very different from the right arm. And if you look at the foot on that left leg, it's at a very strange angle that you may not actually pick up the first time you look at it. This is because both the left arm and the left leg were intruding more into that negative space in the lower left hand corner of the image, which normally wouldn't be a problem except for when you're dealing with magazine covers. That space is actually right where it says Super Castlevania 4 on the cover of the magazine. So after the artist submitted the work, being pretty happy with what he had done, uh, he was given notes to move that left arm and left leg so that they could make room for the text that was going in the lower left hand portion of the cover. So if you ever wondered why his foot looks so funny, that's why. Part of the background stonework has actually been retouched since the original magazine submission. This was because the art was stored rolled in a non-climate controlled environment for a number of years. And when it was finally pulled out of storage, it was stuck to itself. Thankfully, it was still in the possession of the original artist, so he was happy to retouch it. Well, we're getting pretty close to out of time, but before we go, I'm gonna leave you with some up-close camera work to really show you how beautiful this piece is. That's gonna about wrap it up for this episode of Art of Nintendo Power. I really hope you like what I'm trying to do here. This is just the very beginning of what I hope is going to be an amazing, amazing resource for people who want to see more about the art, history, and legacy of this magazine. So if you wanna support my ongoing efforts and continue to see work like this, the best thing that you can do is hit that like button for me. If you have any questions about this or any other piece in the archive, absolutely leave a comment below, or you can find me on Twitter at ArtofNP. I'm very, very active there and always happy to answer questions. Also, that's generally the very first place that I'll show any piece that I add to the archive. So you probably want to follow me on Twitter just to keep up with the collection and the things that I'm doing. Remember, this project is about much more than just the art. It's about the legacy of the magazine and speaking to artists and really capturing their stories and teaching people about practically the lost craft of print magazines. I also dabble in video game preservation. Sometimes I'll find and dump prototypes that either never made it to market or early development versions of games that you love. 
So keep an eye on both my Twitter and this YouTube channel for things like that. Until next time, I'm Stefan, and keep playing with power. Yeah, what do you want to tell me about the paint? I love it. You love it? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What else do you want to say to your YouTube fans? Yeah? Welcome to the future. Welcome to the future? <laughs> say it again. Welcome to the future. <laughs> Where did you hear that? It's from Spanish. It's from Spanish? Yes. Spanish. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay, so you want to say bye-bye to your Facebook friends? Yeah.